hello uh, good day good morning wherever you are in the world um thank you very much for joining us we've got a few people still in the waiting room so we'll just let those in um and we'll give everybody a couple more minutes to, to join there's always um uh, some delays trying to get into the very various platforms um but um thank you thank you all for joining us in the latest of our series of edumundo uh webinars um, I'm here with uh, friends and colleagues from Liverpool John Moores University, um, Hamid and Fotaini, um, and we'll we'll start the session properly shortly. Um, but but for now, um, as is often the the etiquette, if you could just share in in chat uh, where you're joining us from and any institution involved, it's always good to see the the diversity and the reach of uh, of these sessions, just to see where people are located around the world. Hi, Professor Abdul. Thank you for joining us. Good to see you. Hi, Abzi. Sunny Dubai. Well, sunny here in the UK as well. So it's a, it's a rarity for us today. So the sun is shining on us after last night's footballing efforts. Sorry to mention that from a from a Dutch company, but I had to get <laughs> that in, I had to get that in early. Well, it depends because here in the northwest, I'm afraid. Ah summer has not visited us at all yes so we haven't had a proper summer i think we had only three days of sunshine and that was it yeah i'm sorry for you so we have uh yaman um, newcastle hi aiden um alina hi i think we have people coming in from uh university of south wales jordan um where else i caught a few others there amsterdam hi mark thanks for joining Suriname, hi Rochella, wonderful to see you here. Okay, uh, still a couple of people. Let me just let these last few people in, and then I'll um, I'll run through the running order, and we can begin the session. So. Um, the way that we'll approach this is um, I'll give you a very brief introduction um, to Edumundo and to, to today's session, and then I'll hand over to Fotani and, and Hamid will run through um, their experiences, learning and outcomes from their curriculum development during certainly uncertain, uh, uncertain times during um, and post COVID. And there's also an element within this, uh, which is going to be looking at the use of uh, technology within education to help manage uh, some of these transitions. So let me just um, share my screen with you all very briefly, and I'll just run through a few key points uh, before I hand over. Um, so uh, today's, I mean, it's really exciting. I've been looking forward to this all week, actually. It's a fascinating story to share with you um, because we'll be looking at not only curriculum innovation uh, and as well as development, but also we'll be covering off some points around crisis management. And as I mentioned, um, the role of technology uh, in education. And today's session is really meant to be interactive. So if there are any points that come up at any stage, please feel free to uh, pose a question in chat and we'll be very happy to come back and respond real live if we can. If not, we may need to um, bundle some of them up and um, answer your questions at the Q&A session after the, the presentation. A um, bit of background about Edumundo, very briefly. We are a uh, Dutch company uh, founded in 2001. There's uh, nearly 40 of us now. Uh, and the bottom line here is that we're working with over 100,000 of your students uh, each year. Uh, which gives us a lot of uh, expertise and knowledge um, in terms of how to help innovate and drive engagement and, and work with you towards those student success goals. Um, somewhat ubiquitous slide uh, with all of our clients, some of our client uh, logos, but we're really proud of this. We are a relatively small company, but we've got a truly global footprint these days. Uh, with partnerships in place from Shanghai over to Atlanta in Georgia, from Hawaii to Iceland, Cape Town to Edinburgh, um, really covering all the corners of the world these days. Uh, and the way that we're working uh, with you all is, is really continually evolving and, and, and innovating. And while we'll be talking a lot about management simulations today, it's really important for me to emphasize that these are uh, 
one leg, if you like, of, of the proverbial three-legged stool and that help us to drive curriculum innovation. And that's why the subject matter again today was of such interest to us and we wanted to run this session with you. Um, so I'll talk about simulations in a little bit, but um, I just wanted to also to flag up a couple of other of our business areas that we now seamlessly integrate with our simulations to provide some really fascinating uh, learning tools. Um, the first that I'd like to draw to your attention to is our EdStacks, EdStacks, apologies there, EdStacks product line. And these are micro learnings. Um, and in this space and on this platform, students independently uh, need to acquire key skills and build their knowledge around subject matter such as employability, intercultural communication, personal leadership, logistics, project management, a veritable and substantial library of um, different disciplines and subject areas that students can access. And then the other business unit product line that we have is our engagement app. And this is really the, if you like, the cohesive piece, the glue that brings everything together around simulations, around EdStacks, and through the Brightbirds app itself. And this is where we can create uh, and send via push notifications a variety of challenges and tasks for students to engage with um, to make sure that they are actually making the best use of the resource and the material that's been put there for them. And it also really helps, particularly around um, uh, group projects, to really make that whole experience real and vibrant and live. And it's through these three channels that Edumundo is right now with uh, a number of our higher education institutional partners delivering real curriculum innovation, whether that's helping to develop brand new uh, curriculum for modules and courses, or whether we're enhancing and, and using a mix, if you like, of traditional and, and new learning approaches to help you um, deliver against your learning and, and teaching objectives. Okay, so looking specifically at management simulations, there's, as we all see, a lot of academic evidence uh, and, and real life evidence now that management simulations really do drive student engagement. And the higher the, the levels and rates of engagement, obviously the, the higher the, the learning outcomes and the entire uh, learning experience is really enhanced for students by being put into these very realistic management scenarios. We can evidence um, higher student module satisfaction across all of our partnerships. Um, and all of these pieces come together then to, to clearly leave the student once they've left your institution um, with much greater employability skills. I mean, for example, if you think about the management simulations them themselves, the team dynamics require their soft skills to be really honed and worked on. And that's really critical in the workplace. So we're seeing improved retention, progression, and certainly developed um, graduate outcomes. Some more practical and operational uh, pieces for you to be aware of around the use of our management simulations. All of our simulations are web-based. Um, they'll work on any device, um, given the, the level and uh, depth of some of the, the data that's contained within the simulation. Laptop and PC is preferable, but absolutely tablets and even, even a handheld device um, can manage that. And we create a, a uh, unique set of economic environments within which your students will compete in teams against each other. They're managing their own company. We're creating a really safe, a safe, safe space where they can apply the theory and frameworks that they've been learning in class. But these are also very safe environments. They can make mistakes. They can break things. They can try things perhaps they haven't thought of previously. And the structure of the simulations is very straightforward. They're broken out into a series of rounds, and each round equates to one year of trading or operations for their very own companies. And it takes about, well, depending on how you want us to have it set up, between five and 20 hours. Really importantly, there is a dynamic algorithm that powers these simulations. Um, so they're not able to get to the so-called right decision by process of elimination. Teams are competing directly against each other for market share. And that's what makes it so much fun. That's what gets the engagement level so high. There's a really uh, enjoyable competitive element here. And we can work at all student levels from foundation 
even with with younger uh, groups actually all the way through to uh, level seven or, or graduate MBA level studies and there's a lot of flexibility in our simulations um, important to point out as well a, a couple of things here around assessment no need to revalidate your course if you're thinking of using a simulation uh, we can work with any assessment and we can help um, structure that and advise you on some suitable approaches to take and equally importantly these simulations are AI proof. They're end-to-end -end encrypted and they are absolutely unique data sets. So G chat GPT has a very limited application here. And one of our competitive advantages as we see it is our um, support package. Um, we don't believe it's really necessary or beneficial for you to learn another third party platform. So we'll do all the customization, we'll create the simulation for you, we'll automate it, we'll get it set up and running. We introduce the session, we support the students all the way through uh, with an online help desk. You have full access to everything the students are doing and we'll also provide you with quite detailed summaries of students' activities at key points. And everybody um, at the end of the simulation will receive a micro-credential they can post on LinkedIn or other um, social networks to, to evidence those um, graduate outcomes. And last but, but not least, um, I do want to draw your attention to the fact that while we are um, going to be looking at our operations management simulation today, we do have, in fact, 10 uh, simulations in our portfolio. We're developing more as we speak. Um, and for example, Phone Ventures, my marketing experience and trainer startup are all relatively new uh, simulations that we've put into the market. And the point here is that we take the approach that students to get the most beneficial experience out of these need to have that really holistic view. So they manage operations, but they're also responsible for the strategy. They need to be thinking about the financial state of the company. They need to be thinking about the welfare of their workforce. They need to really look across the board at the entire management proposition. So if there's any interest in discussing any of these points, uh, please do let us know and we'll be more than happy to, to follow up. Um, so on that point, I'd like to thank you and, and welcome you once more, and I'll hand over now to, to Hamid and Fortaini. Thanks very much. Thank you very much, uh, Peter. That was very um, helpful and insightful. So should I share my screen now for our slides? Okay. Yeah. Yep. Um, can you all see my screen? Okay, good. I don't know if I can, yeah, okay. That's great. So hi everyone, um, myself and uh, Dr. Hamid uh, Banjai Fuladgaran uh, is go we're going to present um, our paper based on how we changed, so how we developed our curriculum because of uh, the COVID pandemic. Um, so that was the paper that we published and Peter and the other uh, people from Adjumundo decided to um, ask us to uh, do this webinar. So that's the paper we published. Uh, it was on the dedicated journal of informs for transactions. It's called Transactions on Education. So that's a dedicated journal for operations management teaching and operations research teaching. So I highly recommend if you don't know that you could have a look if you're an educator in this area for case studies and ideas around uh, teaching and learning. Uh, so the outline of our presentation today would be briefly mentioning the challenges we face during the pandemic. I'm pretty sure we're all aware of those. Then Hamid is going to take over and talk about the challenges when teaching operations management. And then he's going to discuss how we changed the modules, how we adapted the module because of COVID and the fact that we had to teach purely online. And um, we have also developed a framework based on these adaptations. Uh, so Hamid is going to present that as well. And then I will take over to talk about how we use 
uh, Edimundo simulation game, which was already part of our face-to-face -face delivery and how we use that also during our online delivery. And then we're going to share some insights regarding the student feedback. So what students thought about this um, use of the simulation game. Uh, so I'm pretty sure you have, you are all aware of the challenges that we faced when COVID hit the world, I'm afraid to say. So that's why it was declared a pandemic by the World Health um, Organization. It affected more than 170 countries and more than 1.5 billion learners. So that is a record. And the challenge we all faced is that many countries went into lockdown. So that meant that overnight governments said, okay, now you're not allowed to teach face-to-face. -face. You have to teach purely online. So we had to develop um, ideas on how to do that. And someone would think, okay, we have taught online before. There have been online courses for years out there. Why don't you use any of these techniques? Well, the problem is that these were normal online courses. So students would uh, register, would enroll to these courses, knowing that they would be delivered online or remotely. In our case, we had to do what we call emergency online teaching. So overnight mod, uh, programs, courses that were designed to be taught face-to-face -face or in a blended mode had to be taught purely online. And that makes things completely different. Um, and now I'm going to hand over to Hamid. Thank you. Yes. And about the challenges during the um, pandemic and also in overall for teaching the operations management. So um, we had and we have still we have a few challenges for teaching this module. I think that is going to be same for many, many uh, countries um, and universities across the globe. But we are teaching this module for the uh, second semester, uh, first year of the uh, business management uh, program in Liverpool Jammus University. And the challenges that we are facing to teach this module, first of all, is it, the students do not have uh, prerequisite uh, knowledge about the operations management. So uh, many of them, they are coming from the high school directly to the university. So it's going to be the new um, environment of learning for them. They need to adapt themselves with a new environment. This module includes um, mathematical uh, models, calculations that, okay, some of the students don't like it um, uh, to do that. So quantitative methods is not something that the students like. Um, another problem um, that still we are facing with that is the engagement and motivation for the students. Uh, the attendance um, is not good and was not good also during the COVID pandemic. Um, students um, have too many absenteeisms and um, engaging the students uh, to the class, to the, to the programs and um, to the curriculum, it was one of the, and it still is one of the problems that we have. And beside that, we are teaching some complex um, concepts, including lean supply chain management, um, Q management theory, and so on and so forth. That's, they are a little bit difficult for the students at this level. So what we have done um, during the um, live online lecture, it was that during the COVID, we decided to introduce the module to the students. Uh, online via the um, Zoom. Then we moved to the uh, Microsoft Teams. So we try to engage the students via different methods that we have. Um, and we try to provide um, as many as examples that we can provide for the students because it was not face-to-face. -face. And um, yeah, still we had some, uh, some issues in terms of the engagement of the students. So we decided to record all the sessions and upload it into our learning management system. While in the face-to-face -face, um, teaching or uh, Philip online teaching as well, so we had some other methods to apply. For example, we provide some case studies for the students. We show them too many 
YouTube videos um, um, in the class and sometimes we provide them as a link the students can can watch later on and we try to engage them in the class as a facilitator. Um, so these are the differences that we uh, have for these two type of, types of methods. So um, about the flip um, teaching or flip classroom teachings, um, I think that everyone knows that over the uh, past decade is one of the common methods that we have in higher education. So uh, we applied uh, this method in our teaching. Um, so we provided some uh, opportunities for the students to learn themselves. Um, we uploaded all the materials in the learning management system for the students. We are using Canvas. Um, definitely in different universities, they are different, different, using different uh, learning management systems. Um, however, um, sometimes providing this, you know, um, volume of information for the students is quite challenging for them because they come from high school to the university, first year of the university, they are facing with the loads of informations and concepts. This is a bit difficult for them. So what we do in our normal face-to-face -face class is that we engage the students with a uh, question and answer. When we show them the uh, YouTube, for example, video, we try to say that, okay, this is about these concepts and we try to deliver as much as we can. But during the COVID um, and during the emergency online teaching, we haven't had this opportunity. It was a little bit different that I'm going to discuss about it in the next few slides. So this is um, what we had and still we are following the same approach. So we have 12 weeks uh, for one semester um, in Liverpool John Moss. Um, and since we are delivering the module in the second semester, we are facing with the Easter break, um, sometimes in middle of the semester, sometimes it's pushing forward. So we are teaching the um, different concepts in one hour lecture class each week. And then it's followed by two hour seminar sessions. And that's um, in the, um, um, during the COVID, we use the different type of case studies that they were online, they provided for the students. And also we invited the guest speaker uh, from one of the um, uh, automobile um, manufacturers in UK to present for the students, for example, for the application of the lean and um, some of the supply chain concepts. And afterwards, we moved to apply the simulation game uh, which we adopted from Edumundo in three to four rounds. One week for the um, trial version, the students learn how to play with the game. In the following weeks, they compete against each other. They should apply all the concepts that they learn um, within three weeks. And we provided some um, uh, vouchers as a gift or reward for the students who could win um, the simulation game in this competition. So emergency online teaching. This is the framework that um, we develop in our paper and the differences between the face-to-face -face and online. Um, as you see, um, in the face-to-face, -face, uh, we design the assessment based on um, learning outcomes that we have. Uh, and then we go to the class, we deliver the module, we provide some seminar sessions, the students come to discuss about the case studies, watch the videos, and um, they uh, move forward for the um, um, application of the simulations. And the role of us in the face-to-face -face session is mainly is just we play as a facilitators, especially during the simulations. We just reply to some of the questions that we have. We do not give them a, you know direct answers. We play the facilitator role while in the online teaching or during the COVID mainly, the type of communication was different. The type of delivery was different. So we applied the synchronous uh, lecture, which was online sessions and recording at the same time. And we provide the recorded for the students and all the communication with the students, rather than being in the class, it was online via the learning uh, management system in Canvas, sending the announcement, follow up with the students, in the chat boxes, in Zoom, in Canvas, and so on and so forth. And for the simulation game, we try to change our role 
uh, to be more as a coach because we, ha we haven't had that chance to see the students um, in class. So we decided to change our role and we helped them a little bit more and in depth. So uh, when we group them into the different rooms in the Microsoft, in, in the Zoom, we go to the rooms and we try to help them um, uh, as a coach, not as a facilitators. To sorry, make Hamid, the situation before, sorry, before yes. you continue, there is a question about the class size uh, in chat box. Yes. Um, so as you uh, as you see, this is how we delivered the lecture also during COVID. So one of us was talking and the other one was managing uh, the chat box. So whenever, whenever there was a question, we would stop to answer the question and then uh, continue. Uh, so the question is about the class size. We're talking about no normal business school uh, class sizes. So during COVID, we had 420 students enrolled to our mm. module. So we're talking about a large. Mm. Yes, class. this is quite large. And still we have the almost the same number. So it reduced a little bit um, I think uh, last semester we had about 300 something, yes. 307, if yeah. I'm not mistaken. Yeah. No, so Fotini is a module leader. She knows the numbers um, more accurate than me. So this is quite a large class. Um, we are working together for about six years now. It's going to be six years. Um, I joined later than Fotini to John Morse. Yeah. So we are a team that we are running this module. And this is quite a large module. Some, some of the semester we have more tutors for the face-to-face -face mm -hmm. classes. On that um, year, during the pandemic, we had only one more tutors to run yeah. the seminars, but the class delivery was based, you know, me and Fotini at the same time. So one of us answered the students in the chat box, then another one present the lectures, and we try to cover up each other. So sometimes um, I taught the, some of the concept and Fotini answered the students in the class. Yes, it was quite challenging in terms of the size. Still is one of the challenges that we have. It's one of the biggest classes that we have in John Morse for this module because all the level four students or first year students should pass this module as a compulsory module. And yeah, uh, managing um, 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 this size of the class is quite challenging. So I don't want you to think that, okay, this is an innovative um, design for a niche module of 20 students. This is a proper class size of hundreds of students on a generic business management program. So I'm afraid to say that our students choose this program because they're not sure what they want to do. So they're not sure if they want to do marketing, HR, um, supply chain management. That's why they, they choose business management to keep their options open. So that adds to the challenges of teaching operations management to them all. And don't forget about, when we say that about the challenges in the class, you have to imagine about the number of questions that we have in each session to answer. Um, and concepts are new for the students. They don't have the um, background about the these topics that we are delivering. They've never been in the factories. They've never been in the service industry professionally. Um, maybe they are working outside as a part-timer, maybe, I don't know, in restaurants or so on and so forth. But, you know, coming to this class, which is a bit is technical, uh, is quite challenging and answering loads of questions from the students. So we are talking about how we could deal with um, these numbers of students and how we could um, deliver the module successfully. So um, me... can we go for the last slides that I need? Yeah, this, yes. is, this is what we develop and also you can find it in our paper. Um, all the modules in, in programs, they have the um, um, learning objectives or learning outcomes. So using something like a simulations, um, or in overall, um, during the COVID or during the pandemic, using the computer requires the infrastructure. So the students need to access to the laptops, tablets, and so on and so forth, a good internet connections, uh, and also about the platforms that we could and or we can um, uh, communicate with the students. For example, for us is Canvas. It's quite simple. We are sending announcements. We are receiving messages from the students on the platform and so on and so forth. So what we are saying is that 
it depends on these two assumptions, infrastructure of the institution and also um, the, the equipments that the students access to them. Then based on that, we decide that whether we can deliver the module synchronous or asynchronous, and we adjust the curriculum based on the situation. So because, you know, it was in March 2020 that within a few days, the university decided to shut down the university and we're supposed to go home and deliver the module. So we're supposed to adjust what we offer to the students and we promise to the students and we try to, you know, tailor it based on what they asked. And then the rest of the things, it was assessment feedback, you know, uh, mentoring the students and delivering the module at the end of the sessions. So this is my part. I just pass it again to Fotini to cover the simulation parts and the students' feedback. Thank you very much, Hamid. Can you please um, manage the chat box? Sure. Thank you very much. So um, as I've said, we have been using Pro Sim Advanced simulation game over the Mundo for the last 10 years. So we're quite experienced. Uh, into using this game. Uh, so we, <clears throat> we originally used it in the face-to-face -face delivery, but we also uh, used it during COVID. Uh, the reason being that it was very easy to use in an online course, but also we could very easily adapt um, our material and we were able to use it during COVID without any issues. Just a little bit of background on the game, if you're not familiar with it. It is available in two languages, English and Dutch. Obviously, we're using the English version. One of the advantages that um, we really like is that you don't have to install any software that was particularly useful during COVID because students didn't have to download anything into their machines. As you know, there, are, there might be compatibility issues if you're using different types of desktops or laptops or different um, software systems. Um, so th the fact that it is web-based, it runs on any browser. We haven't had any issues um, with any browsers so far. And um, what students have to do is they need to run their own company. They are a sporting goods retailer, so they have suppliers and they sell to customers. So they are a B2C company. Um, the whole point is for them to understand the complexity of business decision making and work as a team at the same time. And obviously the decisions they make, they have an impact on the other decisions they have to make, but also on their competitors' decisions. So we want them to see this in their connectivity uh, within the decision-making process. They have to sell four different products, football skis, snorting working sticks, and tennis rackets. However, this is the most customizable version of Edumundo. So you can you have uh, options to choose from if you don't like these products. And um, what is important is that the goal is not only profit maximization, but they have a number of um, areas within a balanced scorecard. And the goal is to maximize the points that you get uh, in all the areas. The good thing also is that they get to see how other teams are doing in one leaderboard. And that adds a hugely competitive element. You wouldn't believe how competitive they can get. Um, and Obviously, one of the other advantages is that they learn how to make decisions in a safe environment. So they're not destroying someone else's company. They are just simulating <laughs> a business function. No, this is important to note as well. Uh, so we have included some screenshots of the game. This is the first screen that you see when you um, log in. As you see, it is very straightforward. And then by clicking into the different parts, you go to the specific areas. What we're mostly interested in, I know that as Peter showed, this can be used for strategic um, management. However, we use it for operations and that's why we focus on particular areas. 
So we focus on the price mostly if they're going to do any quality checks. And clearly this is the screen that we're mostly interested in. I would like to say that the supplier choice criteria have been added by Edumundo for us. So I was the one who asked Milo a few years ago whether they could include uh, the theory of order winners, order qualifiers, uh, because uh, we were teaching those and we wanted them to be able to use their strategic order winners, order qualifiers when they do the supplier selection. Uh, in other words, the suppliers order winners have to match your company's order winners. Um, and um, Edumundo have actually put that after our request. So thank you very much. I haven't had the chance to say thank you. <laughs> and then they need to decide on the amounts they're going to order. What is important here also is that there is a lead time of one round. So whatever they order today, they get in the next round. This is one of the most challenging concepts to understand and to teach. So here they apply all the order inventory ordering models that we have been teaching them. And obviously they need to take into account the supplier costs as well. Here they need to calculate the distribution costs so they need to work out based on the number of rounds, what is the most profitable option for them. So they need to work out the break-even point. So the amount of um, pro the overall amount of products that they project to order. And on that basis, they need to choose the most profitable uh, option from round one. So this is where we, also ask them to do some calculation and some projection. Um, the good thing is that all groups start from the same position. We also include a dummy company as a benchmark. So if you don't make any decisions, any changes at all, what is the benchmark? And also, if you want to be a very mean tutor, you can use different scenarios of market disruption. So for example, you've ordered 500 orders. Oh, unfortunately, there is a strike. So you receive only half of them. Deal with it. So things that happen in everyday life. However, as a tutor, you can predetermine the scenarios. So you know this. Obviously, the students don't. And they have to deal with them as they play the game. Um, the results are calculated and released on a particular date that you have to um, set. And it's good to set it in the beginning of the game to give them a, a time horizon of when they need to make their decisions. Um, what we have used is that in the face to face version is that to make sure that everybody contributes to the group decision making, because that's a group, that's a group task, that's a group assignment and a group teaching activity. Um, they have to play the game within the classroom only. That's the restriction we put. However, during COVID, this was not possible because we had students all over the UK and all over the world. So from Russia, India to the USA. And they were in different time zones. That's why we asked them to play outside the tutorial sessions. Um, however, we provided support. So we told them that we would be available at the particular tutorial sessions for any questions if they wanted to ask on top of using the Jumunjo um, help desk. And, uh, but however, all groups had to submit meeting logs. So they had to tell us when they were they had met, how many, who was present and how they contributed. Now, um, as I've said, we used not only for teaching, but also for assessing them and as literature suggests, you shouldn't use the actual simulation game to assess students, as in how well they do in the simulation game, that's the mark they get. So for this reason, what we ask them is to do a group presentation based on the game. So our assessment is for them to present the decisions they've made throughout the game, the results of these decisions, why they've made certain decisions, link them back to theory. And 
they have to present that as a group and that is the mark they get. So they are marked based on the presentation rather than their performance on the game. And that is key. Um, uh, during, obviously during COVID, we asked them to do record presentations. However, when we do the module face-to-face, -face, they do face-to-face -face presentations. So everybody is in class during uh, doing their parts in the group presentation. What I have found is that they prefer to present only to their tutors rather than the whole classroom. So this is something that you need to take into account. Um, Can I add something for Tini? Yes, of course. It's a bit fun. So and surprisingly, and the, the best team or best mark that we gave, it was technically for the teams that they, they couldn't get the best performance in the simulation game. So it means that by chance, sometimes, you know, they, you know, some decisions, they could uh, get a very good result in the mm -hmm. simulation. But when they come to present, they couldn't um, justify the decisions. You know, they, they couldn't connect and link the theory into the practice, yeah. um, which was the simulation game. So and the, the, the point of assessment and the presentation is that we are challenging students that whether they understood what we delivered in the class and how they link it into the practice and to the decision that they made. Yes, that's correct. Thank you very much, Hamid. And if you remember this year, we gave this really high mark to the group that haven't won the presentation in their own um, seminar group, but they did such a great presentation. They have applied all the theory as we've asked them. So that's why they got um, a really outstanding mark. Um, so how to successfully implement a simulation game? First of all, timing is key. As literature suggests, Normally, you should schedule the simulation game as early as possible within the semester. However, we have found, because most simulation games are used for either uh, final year students or for masters um, at the master's level, because we are using it for first year students, we found that for us, it works as completely the opposite. So we have, we always, schedule it, time it as late as possible within the semester because we want them to have learned as much theory as possible first and then try to apply it for the game. So our advice is depending on um, the level that you teach your module, you need to time the simulation game accordingly. Literature suggests that it has to be done early in the semester to grab students' attention, to increase student engagement. As I've said in our case, it's completely the opposite. Tutor support is key. Again, literature suggests that tutor support is very crucial to the success of the game. Uh, that's why we uh, ask our students to do the game within the classroom, not only to see who is participating or not, but also because we are there, we are present, and they feel secure because they can ask anything they want. We are in the classroom and they don't feel challenged by the game in this way. Um, also, as I've said, the assessment is key. So you should assess students based on the game, on how well they do within the game. But because they can become frustrated, uh, obviously only one team is going to win. So what happens with the rest? How do you assign marks? That would be challenging. So that's better to... Um, to avoid that, however, you need to include the simulation game as part of the assessment, and that's what we did, and we found it works really, really well. Uh, I don't know why it's not moving. Okay. Um, also, um, as I've said, the game elements give a highly competitive nature. So having leaderboards or points, any type of competition makes them really, really engaged because they only want to come first and they want to see and they want to beat their classmates. Um, so we've seen it working throughout the years and um, that's a really good element having the leaderboard where they can see how the other teams are doing and where they stand in the stock exchange. Because uh, most of the time simulation games are used for group work tasks, 
Group work management can be challenging, especially during COVID. That was our main challenge. So we're not going to sugarcoat things. The main challenge was to manage group work. The problem is that um, students did not know each other. So even though we ran the module in semester two, we thought, okay, they will be familiar with each other. This didn't happen because they were very reluctant to turn on their cameras. They had no interaction whatsoever in semester one. So when we reached semester two, basically they hardly knew anyone. So they couldn't form their groups because in order to avoid group work issues, we ask them to form, to decide on their own groups. So they normally pick to, uh, to work with friends and things are quite smooth. In this case, we had issues. Um, so if you want to use a simulation game in any online course, our advice is you need to make sure that the students should be able to form their groups easily. They should be, know each other beforehand and they should be able to interact. Um, otherwise, things can be difficult around that. So, um, student feedback. We have used the typical module survey. So every year the university sends out a survey to all the students that are enrolled within the module that stays open for two weeks. And um, they collect the data around student satisfaction, but we also used an online questionnaire that we created to evaluate online student engagement. And also we had that open for two weeks. And as you see, our response rate was much higher because we asked them to complete that during the lecture. So as we see, we had 244 attendees, which was not bad at all. So overall, student satisfaction was really good. I know that you think, oh, it's only 78%. However, based on my experience, neutral is also positive. So whatever is not negative is considered to be um, positive. So we're talking about more than 90% student satisfaction. Um, here and you could see that also because of the attendance. So attendance was not as bad as Hamid described in the beginning. It was quite good, I think, considering the uh, situation. And the same for our questionnaire. I don't want to bore you with numbers. Uh, we have also included actual quotes from students. So students uh, not from the university, they're not only asked to uh, evaluate the course with, you know, numerically, they're also asked, they have, there's a text box and they are required, they're asked to give their opinion. So these are the actual quotes take and we get to see the quotes at the end. Uh, so these are the actual quotes from um, the student feedback. I haven't changed a word, it is as they appeared. On the university feedback, so as you see, they were very positive about the use of the simulation game, how different it was to normal university assignments, um, essay writing or report writing, uh, the fact that they could apply things. Um, it, ha it had been very positive and it has been positive throughout the 10 years that we have been using this simulation game, and that's why we keep using it. Thank you very much. I hope it wasn't that long. Um, and now it's time for questions. So if yes, you... there is one question, um, Claire mm -hmm. uh, asked about that she's using the uh, ProSIM with 300 foundation year business students and it's working well. One mm -hmm. thing is like I found very difficult to explain is the buying of the products, for example, decision versus when they, um, they can sell them. The ah, the, the daily time. So is, she's right. asking for, is, is there any slides that um, uh, she can um, provide okay. for the students to... I'm afraid we don't use any slides. So yeah. we don't use any slides at all. We prefer to explain everything in class ad hoc. So at the time using, you know, verbally. Um, and depending on the group, we might use 
different examples and different ways to explain things. I know, as I've said before, for us, it is the most challenging part as well because they don't understand lead time at all. They think, oh, we will order it, we will get it. No, this is not how it works. And that's why normally we sit down with them, or I do, pen and paper, and I explain yes. the calculation. So this is what we are going to order today. This is what you're going to sell. That's the inventory you're going to have at the beginning of next year. You know, how it works. Show them how it rolls. Uh, sorry, Keller. Uh, first of all, nice to see your face. Uh, nice you to see your face. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, yeah, it's exactly what we do in the class because this is one of the one of the concepts that they the students found it a bit difficult to understand. So my example is always in the classes like this. Um, you want to order something from Amazon. You order it today. When do you when do you receive it? So some students said that, okay, same day delivery, maybe next day delivery, or maybe in, within three days delivery. I said to them that, okay, the time between your order and the time that you receive it is a lead time. If you want to make your customers happy, you need to reduce um, the lead time. So as 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 far as you can reduce this time, eh, you are much faster based on the five operations management objectives that we have in the Slack and Brandon Jones operations management book that we use in the uh, pro team as well. But if, you know, we always have this lead time, they understand it in this way when you give them some real examples verbally. And, and important to add as well, Claire, that, that there are other simulations where this this part of of the operation is uh, is prefaced with actually quite a lot more detail. So you can look at your different supplier options, and you can see the, the you know the different uh, lead times and different indicators. That particularly, for example, I think I mentioned the um, phone ventures simulation, which is very heavily tilted towards sustainability. So in a lot of the simulations now, suppliers also have other indicators around sustainability and other points that students need yes. to, to factor into all of that as well. So, but but thank you, Amit and Fatani. Beautifully, beautifully answered. <laughs> I don't remember the lead time. Uh, where is that on the simulation? I don't remember seeing that. It is oh, is is a the, text under on one the of the yes yeah, on the pro, sorry on the prosim advance. They all have the same lead time. It's in one round, so it's one sentence um, mentioned. I think on the screen mm -hmm. on okay. one of the screens. So yeah, it's not yeah, there is typically a... um, like as in a column or a feature within the game, it is only written as a comment on the game. For us, the reason we use that is because it is simple enough for our first year students, because as I said, it's important to know that we use it for first year students, but also it has the um, appropriate operations management elements that we want. Yeah. Uh, it's yeah. Milo text mentioned text it that it is in the yeah. purchasing page. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. yeah. This is a, there is a sentence explaining that what is the you know time that they um, they receive their orders. Yeah. All right. Any other questions that we can answer? I, I wanted to come back to something that, that we mentioned uh, at one of the early conversations here, Hamid. I think you, you made the point that, you know, the likelihood of, of armed conflict, of other potential pandemics uh, are, are certainly out there. So, I mean, what, what, what are the sort of the primary takeaways or, you know, how, how can this framework that you've developed and, and, and uh, written your paper on, how how is that positioned then to help other academic colleagues around the world? Um, you know that, that might be in parts of the parts of the world, for example, where where there are maybe not pandemics, but certainly some you know quite serious disruptions to, to teaching life. I think that both of us we can answer to this question. The the challenges on that time was that it happened within maybe you know overnight. So overnight, they, yeah, they yeah. they said us overnight. Um, Fotini prepared, um, you know, all the materials to deliver it in the class. And we didn't expect uh, that announcement by the university that COVID, you know, hit the UK and we're supposed to go home and, you know, we shut yeah. down the university. Yeah. So the idea of this paper came from that time that Fotini started to, you know, to develop it based on her experiences. However, application of simulation helped us to, 
you know, not only deliver the module when we do not see the students, but also it, it helps us to engage them and deliver the contents and concepts uh, yeah. with a new type of delivery, which they were not used to it. And also we were not, totally not expecting so, it. Yeah, it was it was something quite strange for us mm. that how we can do that. And um, I remembered when, you know, the similar situation like this in the Zoom, I bombarded by number of questions that they asked because they prefer to ask their questions in the chat box rather than turning on their cameras yeah, and asking yeah, their yeah, questions. Yeah, yeah. However, yeah. you know, the, the way that we cover each other, you know, the way that we we supposed to answer the question regarding simulation again, something like the Claire asked, what is the what is lead time? Why this is like this? How does it impact? Or about supplier selection, why we have four suppliers, for example, in this, why we should choose Henderson, why we should choose Wardowski. Mm -hmm. And you explain this kind of concept for them. And it was it was an idea for this paper. And then how the simulation game helped us to deliver the module. Yeah, yeah. I, I think there's a, a question there, but I think Absi's uh, covered it. We've, we've got a couple of minutes left. I don't know if there's any... Anybody else in yes. the... Uh, Abdul, ask about um, your presentation in the case that you utilize a simulation from the quality management chapter. Could you specify which simulation model uh, was employed? Uh, we don't have specifically using the quality management theories in, in, in this, except that the, as a criteria for the purchasing uh, from the suppliers. So uh, there are five operation management objectives, cost, speed, dependability, flexibility, and and as um, um quality so the students should can choose one of the suppliers based on uh, this five based upon their strategy for for the company so it was not specifically for the uh, quality management model or theory but you know in overall they use it somehow in the simulation game right no problem and I've also shared uh, a link to our paper because um, there was a request about it. As I've said, it is open access, so you should be able to access it without any issues. If you have any issues, please let us know and we will share it with you via email. Wonderful. Thank you. Um, I think we've got time. I, I mean, I'm, I'm quite curious because I get asked this quite, quite often when we're talking to potential new partnerships, this whole idea around the competitive piece. Um, and, you know, there's been quite some some work written on this point, particularly around, you know, with a focus on, on gender differences around that competitive and gaming element. And it was really interesting to hear you talk about, you know, how, how you manage that. But what 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 advice would you have for anybody thinking about that as a potential issue? I mean, what were your overall experiences and you know, how manageable was that element? So in terms of competitiveness, the fact that they can see how it's a, how other groups are doing, that's what gets them going because yep. they want to come first. Yep. In, so in terms of student engagement, that helps a lot. Um, we found that this works better in face-to-face -face because as I've said, with the COVID situation, they didn't really know each other. Mm. So that's why this element didn't add to the student yeah. engagement as much as it does in the face-to-face, -face, because in the face-to-face, -face, they are in the same seminar group. So uh, so how we deliver the module in the Liverpool Business School is that we have one lecture where everybody is there, and then all the students, they are split into groups of 30. So they are in their groups for all the seminars, or tutorials, as you want to call them, or workshops, or, you know, yeah. the terminology is different, but the result is the same. Um, so they get to know each other really well. And the fact that we run the module in semester two means that they know each other very well and they would like to compete, you know, to be first in their group <laughs> a little bit. So that works really well. I don't think the Amazon vouchers add to that. It's just a bonus. The fact that they will be first, that's what they yeah. need. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Um, but with COVID, that didn't work, I'm afraid. However, that's with right. COVID, the different, it was that it was a different way of teaching and of assessing things rather mm. than mm. oh essay report you know something in a written format for them it was the first one 
because they had to do a presentation, they had to do something different. And I think that's why they liked it. Yeah, and... yeah, absolutely. Super, thank you. Well, we've we've overrun slightly, but we, we did make a, a slightly later start than planned. Um, so for Taini and Hamid, thank you so much. I think I could talk a lot longer about this. It's it's genuinely fascinating. So thank you for your great work. Thank you for, for sharing your experiences. And, and thank you everybody today uh, for joining us. Uh, we will follow up. We'll send you a, a recording of, of the session. And if it's okay with you guys, we'll also include a link through to the paper if people haven't um, already accessed it. Um, and yeah, please do stay posted for, for future webinars. So uh, once again, a final thank you very much to everybody. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Bye-bye.